And hello, everyone. So my name is Simon Bennett. I'm one of the um, ZAP project leaders, and I'm a distinguished engineer at Stackhawk. And today I'm going to talk about OSAP 2.11.0. So this is not actually released yet, but it's going to be released very soon. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to give a very quick overview of ZAP for people who aren't familiar with it. Then the main thing, I'll be going through the headline changes, uh, the big changes that are coming in ZAP 2.11. Uh, then I'll give a timeline of roughly when we think it'll be out and finally wrap up. So I'm just going to go straight in. So what is ZAP? Uh, so if you're not familiar with ZAP, it is a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. And it's really looking for vulnerabilities in custom web applications. So unlike some security scanners, we're not really looking for known vulnerabilities in known applications. You know, so you've got a WordPress uh, installation, you know, there are better ways of finding known vulnerabilities with you know, WordPress add-ons. Uh, what we're really looking for is new vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities that potentially no one has found before in these applications. And that's really good because you can then use it to um, test your custom applications, even if they haven't been um, tested by anyone else, by any professional pen testers. So it is uh, an OWASP flagship project. So as you hopefully know, these are the projects that are most mature and uh, the ones you're recommended to get started with. Like all OWASP projects, it is completely free and open source and it's cross-platform. Um, so as long as you have a, a JVM, uh, you know, so it's written in Java, mostly in Java. If you've got a JVM, then it'll run. And I've actually got it running on a Raspberry Pi before, although it wasn't particularly fast. It is well maintained. And I'm kind of making this point because over the years, we've seen a lot of um, web scanners, open source web scanners come and go. Uh, unfortunately, most of them have gone. So very few uh, web scan vulnerability scanners stay around for a long time. And Zap is one of the few ones and one of the very few ones that is actively maintained at the moment. And it is, in fact, probably the world's most frequently used web scanner. And I've been saying this at conferences and talks for many years, and no one's contradicted me, so it must be true. So these are the headline changes that are coming in ZAP 2.11, and I'm going to go through each of these in turn. The first one is the automation framework. So I introduced this uh, at ZAPCon earlier this year, and so it's already available. Um, but it's we've been improving it, and a new version will be coming out uh, with ZAP 2.11. The whole idea is that uh, there's one YAML file that defines everything that ZAP will do. Now, ZAP is already um, automation is, is one of its strengths, and we have um, a lot of people use ZAP in automation, particularly using the package scans and the API. So why do we have this new automation framework? Well, the one thing we found is that the package scans were actually were very useful, um, but they got a little bit complicated. Uh, there's different ways of configuring different things, and they're also tied to Docker. Uh, that's very useful. Um, a lot of people use um, the package scans in Docker, but they don't need to. It doesn't have to be tied to Docker. It's just historical, really. And some people want, wanted to be able to use the package scans outside of Docker, and they wanted a bit more flexibility. Now, we also have the API, so you can start Zap in daemon mode and run the API and control it by the API. That's actually what the package scans do. Um, now, the API is really powerful, but what we found is it's actually a bit too complicated for some people. Um, it gives you very fine grain control, and a lot of people don't know how to drive Zap well enough to drive the API effectively. Now, the package scans and the API are not going anywhere. We're going to carry on maintaining those. Um, although I'll talk a little bit more about the package scans later on. So the automation framework is not surprisingly designed for automation. So you can actually run Zap from the command line, you can pass it in a YAML file, and then Zap will run the set of jobs you've defined, and it will exit. So you don't need the um, user interface at all, which is what you'd expect for automation. However, it does actually have GUI support as well. So it's got to, so you can actually create um, the automation plans and you can run them and you can diagnose them from within the GUI. And I think this is really important um, because that means you could, it makes it a lot easier. 
Um, if you're trying to test things in an automated way, it's very difficult to see what's going on and to diagnose problems. But because we've got the GUI support, you can try things out, see how they work, and make sure everything's working well before you actually export the YAML file and then run that um, in, in automation from the command line. Now, one thing that has been requested a lot is authentication support. I don't think that's going to get in for 2.11, uh, unfortunately. However, the automation framework is an add-on, which means we can update it at any point. Um, so, and that is one of the things we'll be um, focusing on. We're already working on it, um, but that will be a focus. So that will be coming as soon as we can get it done. And I'm now going to give you a quick demo of it. So, I'll now switch over to Zap, and I'll actually shoot, switch to this browser as well so that that gets hopefully used. So this is Zap. It doesn't look that much different um, from 2.10. I'm actually running a dev version at the moment uh, because we haven't released 2.11. And what you'll find is there is a new automation uh, tab down here. And what this allows you to do, you can actually create a completely new plan. And these are all the jobs we've got there. But I've actually got a plan that I've um, created beforehand. And I'll actually just show you that now. So this is the YAML file um, that defines the plan. You can see it's got an environment. And so you have to have a context. And this means that you know the context is called budget. And we've got the URL, the top URL for budget and got a few other parameters. Then you'll see a set of jobs. So we've got a, a passive scan configuration. And for the moment, what we're doing is we're actually only scanning things that are in scope and we're disabling all of the tags because that speeds things up. Then we've got a spider job and that actually has got very little configuration um, because by default, it will just um, spider the first context, but it does have a test. So these are something that are kind of new to Zap. We've got a set of tests, and you can basically test a whole load of things. And we find this is really useful, a really useful way to sanity check that your automation is doing what, what you expect it to be doing. If you're using Zap from the desktop, you can see what's going on. So you can see when things are working, when they're not. When you're running Zap in automation, you don't have that immediate feedback. So what the automation framework um, supports is tests which allow you to sanity check that it's doing what you expect it to do. In this case, we've got a test on the spider that it finds at least 100 URLs. And you'll see we're actually using the um, Zap statistics. So if there's a statistic that Zap maintains, then you can put a test on that. Then we have a job which waits for the passive scan to finish. Um, and then we have um, an active scan. Now, the active scan will actually take some time. So what I've done is I've created a policy where I've turned everything off and I've just turned the cross-site scripting um, rule onto medium. And then we have a reporting job, which I'll talk a bit more about later. So I will switch back to Zap. And I will then open this job. And you'll see down here, this is the how the job is represented in Zap. So we can actually go in and we can edit any of these things. So you can see all the parameters and you can actually go in and edit the context if you want. So everything here is editable. Um, and you can see that we've got the um, active scan here and the rules and we can add more rules. Um, we can change them. So you can just edit the, um, the YAML file, or you can edit uh, the file within Zap within the GUI. And I will now run this plan. And you'll see we've started the spider. If I switch back to the automation tab, you'll see the spider's running. Now that's finished. And the passive scan, if you look down here at the bottom, that's the passive scan queue, which is going down. So this job is waiting until that gets to zero. And then it starts the active scan. And we can see that it is just running the cross-site scripting reflected rule. 
And there we go. It actually, there's the report and the report gets displayed. Now, normally you wouldn't expect that to pop up, um, but what I did was there is actually an option for displaying a report um, in the report job just for, for demos like this. So you can see that that plan ran and we can actually see that the spider has one test and that test passed because it did, we actually have a look at the output here. We can see, hold, we can see we actually found 126 URLs. If we found less than 100, then that would have failed. And the automation um, plans are very configurable. Um, and there's something, so, so we're going to count, you know, this is what we expect to be the main way that people will actually automate Zap in the future. So that is the automation framework. So now I want to talk about is report generation. So the reports that are in Zap 2.10 dated back to Paros days. Um, so Zap is actually a fork of an old, a very old project called Paros Proxy. And the reports dated back to then, and they were very basic. And a lot of people um, found they didn't uh, do what they wanted. And we found that we've had some um, questionnaires recently. Uh, we have a ongoing questionnaires to get feedback. And that one of the things that people kept on saying was the reports weren't very good. So based on that, we created a new report generation um, add-on, and this uses the Timely framework. Um, so this is a, an open source framework, which is very flexible and very powerful. It's actually a pleasure to work with because I created some of the um, templates. Um, and we have a lot more data available. And it's easier to create your own templates. We've got a lot of instructions around that. I said we're using this Timely framework, uh, which is it's a it's a proper framework rather than the kind of XSLT the option we had before. And so I will now switch back. So I will actually show you this example the report that got generated, and we'll see we've got a chart here, um, summary of alerts as before, uh, but then we've got the passing rules. So you can actually include the rules that we details of all the rules that have passed. You see, most of these don't have a strength because they're passive ones. Actually, none of all of them will, um, none of them have a strength. Uh, and you can see there are no other active rules because the only active rule failed. Um, then you get details of the site, and you can see we've got some statistics here about the um, the, the HTTP response codes. There's no authentication statistics, um, but you can see the parameters as well. So we've got all this information. And then if we go down here, we'll see the alerts and we can actually show um, the requests and responses. So there's a lot more data. And if we go back to Zap, we will see you can actually um, generate, so you can generate a report from Zap as well as from your um, automation framework. And there's a whole, we've got a whole load of different options. Um, and we've got different themes for a lot of these reports. And we've got filters, all sorts of things. So this will actually, re this replaces the existing um, Paris reports and all of the other um, reporting add-ons on the marketplace as well, which weren't actually maintained. So that is um, the reporting add-on. And, ah. Oh. So, and I was gonna actually demo that. So what I can do is I can choose, you can see here, we've got all the different sections and the sections will actually depend on which uh, reporting type. So we've got a high level report summary. Um, you see that's got different set of sections, got no themes. And if I generate that report, you'll see it's a very different type of report. So what we have is the option to, so we've got we have we actually had a reporting competition, and both the high-level report sample and the modern HTML report uh, were winners of a, won that, those comp, that competition. Um, and so we got a the traditional reports. If you do want them, um, we got a traditional report with requests and responses. But what it means is we have a lot more flexibility, and it's much easier to add reports and report templates. And I think the competition is ending this month, um, but if you want to add more um, templates 
and more themes, then please do. You know, we, we definitely want more options available to you. So the next headline change is <clears throat> OAST. And OAST is out of band security testing. So this is where um, we're testing for vulnerabilities that are potentially not part of, which you don't typically get a response to. So usually the way Zap works, it will either do passive scanning or when it does active scanning, it will send a series of um, payload series of attacks, and it will expect to be able to tell whether there's a vulnerability based on the responses to those payloads, to the, those requests. But there are some vulnerabilities that are called out of band. So this could be where you have another process that's actually going through and processing logs, and this might run you know, overnight. Um, so it's something where it won't happen immediately, and you won't get an immediate response. In fact, you won't the, the tool zap will not get a response and what we really need to do is check to see whether we can actually call out to another service so we have actually had um, callbacks we had support for callbacks in zap already um, but obviously they would only work for um, if zap was actually running and a lot of these out of band vulnerabilities you actually need a permanent you need a, a service running all the time in order to detect them now Luckily, uh, so we had a Google Summer of Code project um, 2021. So our student Akshat implemented this OAST add-on and it actually supports the Zap callbacks, but it also supports the um, Boast and Interact SH um, third-party OAST servers. So if you actually let's go back to if we go to Zap and we go to the marketplace and you can, you'll see we've got OAS support and there's a lot of information here, including information on all of the services, including Boast. Um, so, and there is actually a public Boast server available. So what you can do is you can actually test for these out of band vulnerabilities right now. Now, one thing it's worth pointing out is this is still alpha. So uh, at the moment, so for 2.11, the ZAP rules will be changed, uh, that you already use callbacks will be changed to use the callbacks provided by the OAST. So the core callbacks are being removed. We will not automatically, we're not going to enable Boast or inter, Interact SH by default. You'll have to choose that because you know, you we're then sending potentially information about vulnerabilities to third-party services, uh, but these are open source projects, so you can actually set up your own servers um, for these things if you want. Um, and it's also, also worth noting that we have a blog post about this. So if you go to the Zap blog, you'll see there is a blog post about the out-of-band application security testing. And then we have retest. So the retest is another new add-on and it allows you to quickly retest issues found in scans. And this was again, another um, 2021 project. Uh, and basically this uses and extends the automation framework. And the problem that it's trying to solve here is when you run a Zap scan, um, you will often find it takes, it can take a long time. So it can take something like, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours. And so it could find potential, you know, find vulnerabilities. And then you want to find out whether those vulnerabilities are still present. And right now you kind of have to actually run the scan again. So, which it could take many hours. What the retest allows, um, add-on allows you to do is allows you to create tests just for particular issues, um, which makes it much easier quicker to, uh, to, to test. And that was developed by our student Pranav. And again, this is still alpha, um, but both of these, these are add-ons and that means we can update them at any time. And so we will be um, working, improving the OWASP add-on and the retest add-on and the automation framework, and we'll be pushing out new updates as soon as we have anything available. And there is a blog post 
for this as well. So if I go back to the Zap blog, you'll see there's the blog post on retesting alerts with OWASAP. And I will show you a quick demo. So if we go to the alerts, we'll see, um, I'll pick the X frame of no, content. Uh, we're missing CSP, um, the CSP header. We can right click here and we can click on retest. And you can choose whichever alerts you want to test. And we can then verify. And you'll see it's actually present. And then what you can do is you can create an, an automation test plan. And so we, you can see we've now got this test plan. And if I run that test plan, you'll see we're running. It is running now. And we'll see it fails. So the test for the vulnerability fails, which means, not surprisingly, the vulnerability is still there. Uh, because we haven't made any changes. But that means it's you can very quickly um, create retest plans which test just very specific alerts. And that means you can test them quickly and you can put them, you can put them as part of your um, regression test as well. Because again, because it's using the automation framework, you can run them from the command line. And I showed you the demo. So what I want to talk to you now about is the Docker changes, because we're making some fairly significant changes to the Docker images. Um, and the main thing is that the stable and bare images will be updated monthly. Now, previously, we only updated them when we did a major release like Zap 2.10 and Zap 2.11. So there will be new um, versions for Zap 2.11, but every month, around the first of the month, not necessarily on the first, uh, but early in the month, uh, we'll update them and we will update the package scans, which are included with the Docker images and the add-ons. We will not update the core. So the core will stay as Zap 2.11, but the add-ons and the package scans will be updated. And this will, um, so they will be tagged by date. So the weekly um, images are tagged by W, year, month, day. And that's what we're, you know, we're going to use S for stable and B for bare, uh, the images. And so they will be tagged. So if you want to stay on a particular tag, then you can do. But otherwise, um, you will actually um, get them. They will be updated, hopefully, every month. And also, the package scans are being migrated to use the automation framework. So the package scans. I said they're not going anywhere, but we're changing them so that they actually use the automation framework under the hood. And if you're using the weekly release right now uh, without um, contexts, um, that without some of the more advanced options, then you're probably already using the automation framework. Um, so this means that through the life of Zap 2.11, more and more of the package scan functionality will be migrated to the automation framework. And that's great because if you want to move from the package scans to automation framework, the package scans will actually generate uh, an automation framework plan for you. So you can generate that plan and then you can use that from then on. So uh, talk quickly about some tweaks and bug fixes. There are a lot of um, changes to the core, which we're going through. Um, I'm just going to mention a few of them now. One of them actually isn't um, a change to the core, it's change to our infrastructure. It's the internationalization. So Zap is one of the very few security tools that is internationalized and localized into loads of different languages. That integration um, with a service called Crowdin broke a while ago, that's been re-enabled. So internationalization of Zap is re-enabled and working again. So Zap 2.11 will have a load more translations and we're gonna try and get, um, kind of encourage people to help translate Zap more. As I said, Zap is one of the very few security tools that is translated and localized. And personally, I think it is very important that security tools are available in people's native languages. We have lots more core stats. And one of the reasons is because of the automation framework and the fact that you can add tests based on the statistics. And we're including stats for manual authentication. So up until now, manual authentication is very, well, you're on your own. Um, but if you actually tell us how to tell, if you tell Zap how to tell whether it's um, authenticated or not, then it will maintain stats. And again, we want that for the automation framework to make it easier for you to tell that things are working as you expect. 
One little change, which I think some of you will find very useful, is Zap actually used to change the header order on some requests. And we do know that some um, WAFs, some web application firewalls were actually blocking Zap on that basis. We're no longer doing that. And that means that these WAFs will not be able to block a, a Zap quite so easily. And we've also included container detection. So Zap will now tell whether it's running in one of the known containers um, because we'll actually have certain features that we know won't work and that's caused some confusion. We're not doing anything sophisticated with the container detection. Um, so for something like Docker, we create a file which we know is present in our Docker image. If that file is present, we assume we're running in Docker. If you create a Docker, Zap Docker image without that file, then the container detection won't work. We're not trying to do anything sophisticated here. We're just trying to detect that Zap is running in one of the known containers so we can disable options that we know won't work like browser launch. So uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly go through the timeline. And basically next Monday is going to be the release candidate. So the weekly release, hopefully Monday, if we have any problems might get pushed back, but the next weekly release, hopefully on Monday, will be the release candidate. We plan to actually freeze the core code on the Friday, Friday, October the 1st, uh, 2021. And we will release as soon as we can after that. So we need to do a whole lot of tests. We need to build the packages, uh, but so I'm not gonna give an exact date for that, but it'll be as soon as we can after the code freeze. And so to wrap up, please try the release candidate and give us feedback. Please fill in the usage questionnaire. So on the main Zap website, zaproxy.org, we have a link to the, the, the latest questionnaire with the currently usage, and we have used the questionnaires um, as a basis of the things we're focusing on. So the report add-on was um, one that was created specifically because of all the feedback we had. And contributors are always welcome. So there's always loads to do on Zap. So if you'd like to get involved in an open source web security project, then please get in touch with me. And to find out more, uh, go to zaproxy.org. Uh, ZA and that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>